I'm uh, Andrew Grigg and I'm the Director of Clinical Hematology at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. I have interest a whole, over a whole variety of, of blood cancers. I, my career started many years ago, as you can tell from my grey hair, um, and my particular interest was in allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, which I started in Vancouver in the late 1980s. Um, and since then I, I've in, in, interest both in allografting and autografting, particularly more recently in lymphoma and, and myeloproliferative proliferative diseases like chronic myeloid leukaemia, and particularly more recently the role of immune therapy in treatment of these various conditions. Autographs are when you have a transplant using your own cells. It's most, they're most commonly done in patients with lymphoma or myeloma patients with relapsed lymphoma or as upfront treatment for myeloma. And what happens is the patient's stem cells, which are normally stuck in the bone marrow, are released into the bloodstream, usually by giving some injections to allow this to happen. The stem cells are collected and then frozen down in liquid nitrogen. Then the patient uh, later on will then go and receive high dose chemotherapy to try and kill as much of the tumor as, as possible. That also kills the bone marrow cells as well. So we take the cells out of the liquid nitrogen, reinfuse them back into the, to the patient where they circular, circulate in the bloodstream, grow back in the bone marrow, restore the blood counts and allow the procedure to be safe. It's like a stem cell rescue as much as a transplant. It's different from an allograft where the stem cell transplant is using cells from a donor other than the patient. Well, there have been a number of breakthroughs across a whole variety of malignancies. Um, in chronic myeloid leukaemia, for example, uh, where we used to, that was the main cause of having an allograft in the 1990s. It's now well controlled and cured in some patients with some, some simple capsules or tablets each day. In lymphoma, there have been breakthroughs, particularly with immune therapy, using drugs that harness the immune system to stimulate the immune system to attack the lymphoma, particularly in, in diseases such as Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, in myeloma, there have been a whole variety of new drugs, carfilzomib, pomalidomide, daratumumab, which improved the survival in patients with myeloma, although we're still searching for the elusive uh, cure. And in, in leukaemia and other diseases, uh, one of the major advances has been defining which patients may need a transplant or not by detecting what's called minimal residual disease. So trying to work out whether a patient with leukaemia has been cured of the leukaemia without the necessity for a transplant or has minute amounts of leukaemia left behind that needs another procedure. So what's called MRD or minimal residual disease detection is now a major component in our transplant decisions. That technology really wasn't available a decade ago. Hematology malignancy is, is across a, a large area, so I think there are emerging breakthroughs in, in diseases individually. For CLL, or chronic lymphocytic leukaemia, for example, there are new drugs, abrutinib and venetoclax, which may really substantially impact on the long-term prognosis of these patients and potentially lead to cure. Myeloma is, remains, myeloma and um, poorer risk leukaemia remain big areas which remain uh, unresolved in the sense that we, we don't necessarily have curative options in these patients. I think we would hope that there may be new breakthroughs in myeloma treatment. There are emerging therapies with what's called CAR T cells that many uh, patients are aware of. That's very expensive at the moment and not generally available, but it's a very exciting area in harnessing the patient's own immune system to attack these tumours. So if we can get the technology down to a affordable level for general patients in the community, that may be, may be a major breakthrough, but that's a fair way away, I think. Um, and also using these treatments, if they're economically feasible, earlier in the course of, these, of the diseases of these patients, rather than waiting for the end stage where they've had four or five lines of treatment, using them early on and attacking the lymphoma or the myeloma or the leukaemia early in the, in the phase of their treatment. So I think this immune therapy approach is probably where the action is going to be. It is now and will be for the next decade.
we're talking here about allogeneic transplants um, for donors for those patients. So, uh, it's an inter interesting question. So, if you're going to donate cells to a brother or sister for a transplant, you are going through a vetting process to make sure that your health is adequate and you are safe to, to, to donate cells. So you have a very general uh, or detailed health review to make sure that you're, you're, you're healthy, your vital organs are fine, you haven't got any viral diseases. So you get sort of a free health check. Uh, you're also given a lot of information about the injections that you'll be given to, do, to, do, to donate stem cells. Uh, and then usually a follow-up after, after you've donated the cells. So there's a, there, there's a specific uh, process that's involved with that. We have what's called an apheresis clinic at my hospital where you sit down with the consultant and the apheresis nurses and go through a whole education program. So it depends what disease that they have, but the most common patient, not surprisingly, is, is what's the impact of the disease on my life? Is it going to affect my lifespan? Am I going to live or die? Um, and I, I usually try and give optimistic, optimistic realism. So uh, it's important when you discuss these issues with the patient to make sure that they're prepared to accept what you're going to tell them. Occasionally patients don't want to know, and again, as I said, you have to, re to respect that. So when I'm talking to a patient, I say to you, I'm going to give you some statistics and my, my, my overview of your condition. Are you happy for me to discuss that in detail? 90% of patients say, that's fine, I really appreciate you being honest with me. There's a small percentage of patients that, again, don't want to know, and you have to respect that. So when, if I do get that approval, I try and tell them a, as much as I can, focusing, again, on, on the facts, but also trying to put a... Uh, a realistic, positive outlook on things, particularly because what's happening in, in, in haematology malignancy at the moment is things are changing year by year, month by month. So I say to my patients, yes, at the moment your disease may behave in this fashion, but we don't know what's going to happen in the next one, two, three, five years. There may be new developments that alter the whole equation. So what I'm telling you today may be completely inaccurate, and my aim is to potentially to keep you going until the next major advance comes along. Um, so it's sort of, it's an exciting area to, to be in and we, we try and emphasise what's happening in the world of research to our patients. Well, I think it's, it's, it's clear that patients need to be empowered to learn as much about their disease as possible. It gives them understanding, allows them to communicate effectively with their doctors. Um, some patients prefer not to know too much about their disease and we have to re respect that. But we certainly give patients the opportunity through various uh, websites, nursing coordinators, the Leukaemia Foundation, access of materials to uh, learn as much as they can and ask meaningful questions. It is difficult in an interview with a patient, which is often time limited, to cover everything. So we do use the resources of organisations like the Leukemia Foundation to help support that. Uh, and in my institution, we're lucky enough to have disease-specific nursing coordinators for lymphoma and myeloma and acute leukaemia that can spend specific time with a patient and help educate them as well. I think communication is really important. There are patients that, that deal with all the, the medical uh, health issues, side effects of their chemotherapy and that sort of thing. And I think it's really important that they communicate with their doctor or their nursing coordinator about issues that they have. So for example, if I have a patient who's going through chemotherapy every three weeks, I see them before each chemotherapy course and discuss exactly what's happening to them and what things went wrong and how we can improve them. And be surprised about how often they tell you things that you can just finesse to make the course of their journey better. The, the, the other thing that, that I would say is that if they're struggling and they're not coping, don't keep it to themselves. Don't try and internalise that. There are people out there with expertise who are very willing to help. Um, so use the resources that are available to you. And if your doctor doesn't have time, use the Leukaemia Foundation or use the, use the nurse coordinator. All our patients are giving the contact number of a nurse coordinator and their, and their, their phone, call, phone numbers to ring. 
So communicate, be open and honest, don't let things fester.